This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with editor Mark Bauerlein the book The State of the American Mind. 16 Leading Critics on the New Anti-Intellectualism. The book is co-edited with Adam Bellow. Mark Bauerlein is an English professor at Emory University, and he is the senior editor of First Things Magazine. He is the author of several books, including most recently, The Digital Divide, Arguments for and Against Facebook, Google, Texting, and the Age of Social Networking. Mark, welcome to the program. I'm glad to join you. So, Mark, just playing off the title, uh, what is the state of the American mind? And maybe we should say uh, in this volume uh, how you how you and your co-editor and your introduction essay define the American mind. Sure. The American mind is is really the collective American intelligence. Uh, What do people know? Uh, What do they know about their own history? What do they know about their government? What do they know about the principles that underlie the nation uh, in which they occupy? What are their tastes? What do they like to do in intellectual terms uh, with, with their time? Do they, how much do they read? Uh, do they follow the newspapers, <laughs> watching uh, mass media? And finally, what are, their, what are the values, that they, the deep values that they have, particularly as they relate to those cardinal American values of self-reliance, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, First Amendment liberties. I wanted to try and you know, I wanted to share a few quotations that you guys have in the foreword from uh, various figures in the American past that might help us think about the American mind, uh, and maybe th- those will uh, spur, spur, spur some discussion for us. Uh, you, you quote John Crivacor uh, from Letters of an American Farmer, written in 1782. Uh, he says, quote, the American is a new man who acts upon new principles. He must, therefore, entertain new ideas and form new opinions." Uh, End quote. What what do you think he means there? Well, I think this is a classic statement of American exceptionalism. The early Americans, and many Americans still today, believe that the American situation from the very beginning was something new and different, a new order in the world that coming to America uh, with with the immigrant experience and then facing this continent that seemed to them largely empty uh, in spite of the Native Americans and, and the wilderness, that this was something different. This was a historical advent that had not happened before. And when they would look at what it all means, they often saw it in mythical terms. Uh, or religious terms, Uh, the pilgrims and the Puritans after them modeled their their migration on Exodus, the Jews escaping a place of bondage and persecution and Pharaoh, going through the waters and landing in the wilderness and hoping to end up in the promised land. This is one reason why the, the first settlers often referred to New England as our American Israel even when when the Jamestown colony arrived. Uh, That was a more commercial enterprise, but they did erect a cross as as their first act in uh, in the new land. So these conditions are different. The history is different. We are starting something wholly exceptional in human civilization, and that means we have to be different. We are new. We talk about what is an American. We have this experiment going on in which we've got the most diverse nation on earth from the very beginning. We had people from all different countries. We had them from different religions, speaking different languages. We didn't have equality, but we certainly had diversity. How is this experiment going to play out? The rest of the world, after the founding, was waiting for the whole thing to collapse. And and this was a sign that America stood out. 
that people were watching, and it is still the case today. I mean, people in Europe follow the American elections very closely. They feel that what happens in the United States affects their lives personally. Sometimes this is a pathological condition among Europeans. But uh, to get back to the the quotation, Mm. uh, yes, there is something going on here that is different, and the people have to be different as well. And, And it's interesting, Krevko comes down to ideas. Okay. What makes us American? It is our commitment to certain ideas and values. We are Americans because we declare an oath to the Constitution. We're not Americans because our parents were or our grandparents were. We're not Americans because we have some organic tie to the land, the way Europeans do going back centuries and centuries. We have too much mobility and diversity for that. No, we have a civic commitment to the country. We believe in what the Declaration says. We believe in what the Gettysburg Address says. We, we honor the Federalist Papers and, and the principles outlined there. That's what makes us American. And these are, again, to be a city on a hill for everyone to, to observe and actually to, to emulate. I want to think about just just one more quotation you have, um, and it's in the same paragraph. And and I want to ask you a question and just sort of think about uh, the types of potentialities that are present uh, in it, if if it is, in fact, a definitive statement of the American mind. Uh, And then we can move forward and, and really talk about the essays and the tools of analysis the authors use in evaluating uh, the current state of the American mind and its and their rather pessimistic conclusions about a lot of that. Uh, but you quote, quote, quote Tocqueville on the American way, uh, quote, to accept tradition only as a means of information and existing facts only as a lesson to be used in doing otherwise and doing better, to see the reason of things for oneself and in oneself alone. Now, that quotation stood out for me and uh, you know, maybe this is my own idiosyncrasies, the way, the way I read Tocqueville uh, so strongly, his statement, and, and I think we see that here, that uh, the Americans have not read Descartes, but nevertheless, they're the most thoroughgoing Cartesian people in the world. And what he means by that is uh, authority is only accepted on a democratic basis, on mm-hmm. experiential basis as to what's good for the American people as they conceive of it, and yet so much of the book, particularly the second volume of Democracy in America, is fears, uh, concerns, uh, laments over what democracy introduces and what it might dispense with uh, authority, cultural authority, religious authority. Uh, Things could be reduced and brought down to a democratized way. And I see in that quote uh, a part of that analysis, and of course Tocqueville wants to build back in things that could ward off potentially those sorts of uh, deadening effects of democracy. Uh, But yet the quotation stood out for me um, because I wonder if within our founding there aren't also these seeds of of disorder and of disrepair that your authors are identifying. All right, well, on, on the first score of authority and authority being grounded in, in the people and in individuals, uh, we don't have uh, an established church. We don't have king and court. We don't have landed aristocracy, many, many families who own the estates going back centuries. We have people who uh, are disconnected from their past in their migration across the ocean or the migration from, from the seaboard inland. People are living in circumstances where they have to create their own lives. You know, as Emerson puts it, build there for your own world. The principle of self-reliance says nothing at last uh, has uh, nothing at last is is important to me but the integrity of my own soul. And so we we are asking all Americans to consult themselves, to weigh all opinions. Walt Whitman's uh, another classic statement in Song of Myself, where he says, "I I will weigh everything within me, my conscience." prevails over any external authority. And so we have dissenting churches, we, we, we've got different sects uh, rising up. We look at the Pope uh, through most of American history as a, as a force of evil, 
<laughs> and, and I mean, anti-Catholicism was had a long tradition in this country, culminating in Ku Klux Klan, which was very powerful in the 1920s and anti-Catholic as well, in part because you've got this distant authority that, that uh, Catholics uh, heed. So uh, I think de-, de Tocqueville catches very, very well the sort of the intellectual grounds of that personal appeal. I'm the judge. I'm the court here. Now, de Tocqueville also saw very clearly how this emphasis on individuality can produce a sameness. We lose cultural distinctions that give us a sense of the past that shore up cultural values and tastes and keep opinions from just settling into this uh, not so much conformity as monotony. Everyone is different. Everyone is an authority. Well, suddenly we look around and see everyone's the same. We don't have the kinds of distinctions and greatnesses that we see in the old world. This is this is the problem. It's echoed in Emerson's complaints about conformity. It's echoed in Thoreau saying, I've got to go out in the woods. I've got to be myself in order to live a pure life. Living amidst others is precisely a soul-killing experience. Uh, it, it's echoed, actually, in, in, uh, in discussions of the tyranny of the majority that can that can happen in in any democracy i mean the great the great fear of democracy is demagoguery we will end up with uh, a sovereign people who will not jealously guard their prerogatives they'll end up appointing a new caesar who will use all the tools of of propaganda and faction in order to to destroy this precious uh, set of balances and checks and uh, guarantees of of freedoms, I think we this is a constant issue in America today. We see this in the First Amendment issues at the current time, running up against political correctness and rights being read out of uh, the, 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 the 14th Amendment that are not even there. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. So you, know, you talk about the American mind, the independent thought, uh, the, the industriousness, delay gratification, you know, belief in equal opportunity, and, and kind of the first step forward in the book and um, in these essays, and most of these essays in, in various ways look at the decline or the, the, the descent away from this notion of the American mind that we've been discussing. And the first section uh, is labeled intellectual and cognitive decline with a heavy focus on education. Uh, preceding that is an essay by E.D. Hirsch, um, who, who was really uh, is given credit, I think, for being the first person to really demonstrate in a comprehensive way the problems with, with public schooling under the progressive dispensation that is that has been in effect for, for decades now, stretching back probably to the 1930s. Um, I read E.D. Hirsch's essay that, that public schools have, have cut us off from our history, uh, in effect, and that, and that this has been largely accepted. Um, and, and, and he also has kind of a utilitarian analysis. And this is to the detriment, really, of, of working class and poorer children, because we can assume in certain ways um, children from, middle, from college-educated families will find ways to to receive that history and that they'll need it. Um, but with the intellectual and cognitive decline of, of education, um, isn't it, it's interesting to me to think about though, uh, we do seem to be conversant with our past uh, and we have kind of a political expression of that with the Tea Party, which seems to be, uh, the Tea Party means that I've gone to uh, locally, I see people very conversant with the Constitution, not at an academic level, but at, uh, they've, they've read arguments, ideas, and essays, so they want to recover it and present it in public forum, public forum. So I just was, I guess, was thinking about that part of the Hearst piece, which I think is largely right, uh, and yet we still seem to be finding ways to overcome our disability there. We're, we're, we're trying. And, and I actually regard the Tea Party as one of those populist upsurges that is one of the things that, that reju- 
rejuvenates uh, the political sphere in our country as it constantly threatens to, to decay. Now, we'll see about the success of the, the ultimate success of the Tea Party. I mean, the Tea Party did, has given us several political candidates, but it has come only through great dissent or dissension. I would say. I mean, look at how much abuse and vitriol has been poured on the Tea Party by, uh, we'll just call it the cultural elite in this country. I mean, they. Uh, how often has the Tea Party been called racists? I mean, Paul Krugman referred to them as the heroes of D.W. Griffith's film, The Birth of a Nation. In other words, Ku Klux Klan members. That's what that film, that's the nation in, in that. Uh, they, they have been covered by news reporters or, you know, by, by uh, television uh, media like Chris Matthews as if they're a bunch of crazies. I mean, they've used the word crazies applied to them. The popular politicians, Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, Look at look, look at the way the media treats them as well. And what that shows is there are powerful forces operating in this country against precisely that fidelity to the US Constitution that the Tea Party people represent. They don't like it. And I think this is this goes a little outside the topic of the book, but I would say we we have a different uh historical memory now. The most authoritative episode in the United States for 180 years, 190 years maybe, was the founding. And the extension of founding principles really through the, through Lincoln to the Civil War. This was our default position. We would understand public policy when you really get down to it, does it abide by founding principles, the great patriots, the founding fathers, and and Lincoln? Now, this is not our natural recourse, at least in elite zones. Our natural recourse now is the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King. This is where we go when we want to give a moral authority to something about America in the present. President Obama refers to that much more than he does to to the broader sweep of, of U.S. history. When, when Arne Duncan comes out and announces uh, the education department finding that African-American kids are punished uh, disproportionately for some of the same behaviors, he goes back, he doesn't go back to uh, the founding and, and the importance of natural rights for everyone. No, he goes back to the civil rights movement, the days of Jim Crow. Uh, President Obama believes that uh, the most important thing about the origins of the United States was our, quote, original sin of slavery. That's what matters. So I think that uh, you have this emphasis on the broader sweep of U.S. history running against the morally intensified and politically correct uh, referral to the civil rights movement, and, and that this is a historical contest. It's a cultural contest taking place right now, which is what the, the Tea Party is, is going to continue to face in the coming years. Yeah. And it's it's only going to get worse as we see religious liberty finding itself in the courts again and again on the basis of these anti-discrimination rights or dignity rights that Justice Kennedy has dreamed up uh, in his in his rulings in recent years. Yeah, interesting. Just on this discussion um, and what Americans uh, don't know that they don't know, maybe. Uh, Edie Hirsch laments that uh, all of the writings, uh, 
that that that, that he put forward uh, largely have been uh, have never been implemented. Uh, well, well, then the funny thing is that Hirsch. Hirsch is a lifelong liberal Democrat. Exactly. He exactly. regards cultural literacy as a progressive move whereby uh, what we need to do is we need to teach underprivileged kids, black and brown kids, the cultural, historical materials that middle class and upper class kids get in their homes. And so he compiled that list of cultural literacy terms. Well, the list was quickly denounced as just being too white, too male. Too Eurocentric. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and I, I, I th- so it's interesting in reading Hirsch's essay, just like how you could cut a people off from their past. Uh, one <laughs> exactly. Level. But then number two, I, I kept waiting for Hirsch because I've seen certain conservatives point to Hirsch uh, when they defend the Common Core, the few that still do, as being this was an attempt to realize at a national level what Hirsch was writing about. Uh, my own investigation of the Common Core reveals that's not really what happens when you really get into what it does and the yeah. way it way it demotes literature, the way it uses a certain measuring framework to demote literature, uh, well, here, and at here's the same the, time to promote uh, technical learning or policy learning or op-ed learning. I mean, I was thinking, you know, my, my own son, uh, which I, I pulled him out of a school where he was in, when we realized what was going on, he was reading an op-ed about genetically modified foods. But Hirsch never addressed, oh, please. Hirsch never addresses the Common Core and this new essay, which makes me think he also is not, not a proponent of it. So I, uh, uh, I, maybe I'm wrong yeah. in concluding that. Well, well he, uh, here's the way to look at it. Common Core was influenced by Hirsch, and David Coleman is a big fan of E.D. Hirsch. But here's what happened. You've got the actual standards themselves, and then you've got these appendices in Common Core. The appendices are very much about great literature, building background knowledge, uh, forcing teachers to spend more time with Shakespeare, the great works. The reading lists there are, are, very, are very strong, but those appendices are just advisory. Yeah, they're not, they're not required. Be- they're just recommended. When you look at the standards, they're so pared down. Yeah. They're, they're, they're so abstracted that all the, pretty excellent. much all the content knowledge can be just eliminated. Exactly. No, exactly. Uh, now, and, and, you know, thinking about the first, um, first session, you, ha- you have a great piece, The Troubling Trend of Cultural IQ, uh, a great contribution in thinking about the Flynn effect uh, or the rise of IQ uh, scores uh, uh, amongst Americans. That was first noticed amongst yeah. GIs, uh, but yet the corresponding uh, inability of reading comprehension of knowledge, as we've been discussing about specific historical ideas and facts in American history. Well, adding yeah. to that, uh, a good friend of mine uh, teaches at a fair, fairly elite law school, uh, University of California, Berkeley, and he recently told me, rarely is it the case when they come to 14th Amendment cases that they even have an understanding of the Reconstruction such that they might be able to understand the original background of the amendment in relation to an evaluation of contemporary uses of it, legal uses of it, uh, and that is an astounding, astounding fact. And yet, uh, these are these are elite elite law students. You know, this is the, the the IQ issue shows IQ scores are going up, but when you break the IQ score down into the different subtests, there there are actually nine or ten subtests of IQ scores that measure different aptitudes. And that ultimate IQ is a composite of all of them. Uh, When you break it down, what you find is the more abstract and hypothetical the questions, the more gains we get. So that when you're testing for pattern recognition, whereby you'll show these, these, these shaded boxes and shapes in a sequence of three, you have to pick the next box that fits the pattern. Again, it's a sort of kind of form of spatial reasoning, totally disconnected from the world. There we see huge gains. And we see the gains because we've asked students to do this more and more in in elementary school and middle school. Again, building hypothetical abstract reasoning skills. As we add more worldly content, to the IQ tests, there we see the gains go down and down and down. 
especially for children. I mean, children have only gained uh, vocabulary, IQ, a couple of points uh, in, in 60 years. This explains why, for instance, NAEP reading scores are flat since the, since the, the, the early 70s. SAT reading scores took a tumble in the 60s and 70s, and today we have the lowest SAT reading scores in 50 years. The SAT added a writing component in 2005. Scores have gone down every single year except two years when they were flat. Now, vocabulary is one of those things where you have to know things about the world. You get a reading passage and you have to answer questions about it. If you know nothing about what that passage is about, it, it gets a little harder. So even if you've got very high brain power kids coming into your university classroom, they can still know nothing about U.S. history. They can know nothing about the ancient world, nothing about the Reformation. They can know nothing about, about Hegel. Uh, the, 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 the problem is that high brain power is no guarantee of knowledge. And they passed through a high school curriculum that didn't demand a lot of knowledge out of them. What it did demand out of them is a kind of technical facility with the exams, and uh, a certain uh, facility in doing academic papers. That's what that's that that's the kids who've gone into the Berkeley Law classrooms, and why they they don't they're just ignorant of of the Cold War. Of, uh, you know. Things. No, no. I and also in a way, I mean, I think just just briefly. The Common Core, in a way, sort of doubles down on this, what, what you're describing in the sense of facility with tests as a, as a pathway of, of, of the government schools themselves measuring themselves uh, using these tests, et cetera, but without the sort of concrete uh, knowledge that you're discussing. Uh, and, and sadly, this, this mode goes along with the right in the right's emphasis on workforce preparation. Yes. yes. And with the left and its emphasis on multiculturalism, which says we really don't like literature written before 1900 because it's too darn monocultural. Yeah. yeah. So, so the left and the right have agreed to just drain the curriculum of literary, historical, philosophical, and, 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 and uh, artistic content. Yeah, I, uh, interesting. And also, of course, you get, you know, the left gets the added benefit uh, of a nationalized curriculum, and then the right turns around and says, oh, we need that for the global economic competition of our workers. We, we need to have this nationalized curriculum. I wanted to think yeah. about you and your introduction essay with, with your co-editor. Uh, you mentioned uh, the great book from 1987, Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind, and what that foretold. Uh, you know, largely Bloom is dealing with uh, you know, relativism on college campuses and the you know, rise of a refusal to think deeply and colleges abandoning uh, as he sought their trust responsibility to uh, part of what we've been discussing here, introduce students to, um, you know, the deep humane learning. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, flash forward 25 years, what are you seeing uh, as a college professor? I mean, you talk about it some in this essay. Uh, in a way, are the problems magnified from what Bloom was discussing then, or are there entirely new dimensions that he couldn't have anticipated? I, I, I think both. Uh, Richard, one, he saw political correctness uh, happening. I don't think he envisioned that it would get this bad. Right now, on college campuses, everyone is afraid. Everyone is intimidated. The regulations, both formal and informal, regarding speech, expression, attitude, classroom teaching, syllabus design, have become, become so restrictive, so fraught, that, again, everyone is afraid. I mean, teachers... Uh, know that if they say the wrong thing, they could have a charge filed against them. They could have things recorded on on iPhones. Uh, they could have colleagues who develop 
uh, resentments, anger at them for having the wrong opinions about things that could compromise their 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 jobs. Uh, we've got more and more activist groups uh, out there willing to take action. And this is one of our contrib- contributors, Greg Lukianoff, who talks about disinvitation. Yeah. How many distinguished speakers have been invited to college campuses and then disinvited when a student group rose up and says, we're going to protest this, we don't like this? We're offended. We're offended by this. And the administrations indulge them because the job of a university bureaucrat is simply to make a problem go away. It is not to address a problem head on. It is not to stand up for university academic principles. It's just to make problems go away. I don't think Bloom saw things reaching this point. Uh, For him, the college campus still had this sort of antic irreverent atmosphere, uh, a rock and roll kind of world. I don't think he saw the humorlessness uh, that we find on college campus. I mean, there is nothing more humorless than a politically correct leftist in, 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 in the world. And so I think I think on that score, I also think that maybe he didn't see, maybe he did anticipate that the curriculum in the liberal arts would go more and more for media, TV shows, of scholars themselves actually taking TV shows as seriously as they take Shakespeare. Um, yeah. I think he's, he still thought, no, in 1907, well, they may feel that way secretly, but they're ashamed to be this way openly. Now they're proud. They're proud to teach courses in Harry Potter. This is a, a claim at this point. And maybe the identity politics are, uh, they've become so pedestrian while still as binding. Uh, I mean, we, we had the politically political correctness scandals of the late 80s and early 90s, and the university was humiliated by these. Yeah. But the scandals didn't change the direction of things, as far as I can see, at all. And the thing is, everyone's happy. I mean, at selective universities... Uh, the universities are happy because they're charging a lot of money, and students are paying. They're getting a lot of applications so they can be selective. The parents are happy because the kids are getting high grades, and they're graduating in high numbers, and so they they are credentialed. The faculty are happy because they're they're comfortable. The university campus is a nice place to work. They don't have to work the students too hard, and the students don't come to their offices and bug them very often. So they're, they can go pretty much their, their own way. I, I, think, I think everyone's content. The only people who aren't content are the employers who try to hire college graduates <laughs> and find they're not ready to do the work. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you note that, uh, and we see that several, several of, the, of your essayists note that, problem, uh, which is which is very telling. We've also got uh, on college campuses, though, a lot of substantial market pressures arising that are uh, breaking up, I, I suppose, this sort of um, uh, system uh, that we have now. And in, in particular, uh, you know, tenure is becoming out of reach, something that, you know, whether it's abolished or not by by state schools, it seems to me very few professors now uh, will hope to attain to tenure. Uh, and we've got also declines, or not an absolute decline, but much more um, uh, students willing to question whether or not they need to go to college uh, for the future, or might, maybe there's a better use of their time. Uh, yeah. So there are yeah. sorts of sorts of pressures here that that could be good uh, uh, in certain respects. Although I suppose, I mean, the way I largely think about it is one of your essays towards the end uh, by Rusty Reno the new antinomian attitude when dealing with particularly the decline of the humanities, uh, if nothing could possibly be true to begin with, uh, if there's nothing for us to actually reason about uh, except for our group identities and every truth claim is really just an assertion of a desire or a class interest or a gender interest to be in effect implemented with force of law, et cetera, then what's there really 
to learn to begin with at a deep, deep level of critical reasoning that, that the humanities demand. It becomes emptied of, of any purpose. Natural law is over. Uh, we, we, we regard everything as socially constructed, even ourselves. Well, okay, then let's, uh, well, let's do what we want. Let's let our desires go where we wish. This is, this is called freedom. This is liberty. This is individualism. And people like it. When you try to tell people, look, the costs of unleashing desire in any direction it wishes to go are devastating, especially for working class, poor, underclass human beings. If you let families break up, I mean, if, if, you, if you make no-fault divorce happen so easily, this is devastating to human beings. Well, there's the contrary that says, but wait, we can't let people go unfulfilled in their lives. And if you try to exert a moral judgment upon them, you have committed the main crime in contemporary society of moral judgment. I mean, look, we, we, our country has spent a month lionizing a 65-year-old man <laughs> who says he's a 31-year-old glamour goddess. I mean, it's not just that we're saying, okay, yeah, Bruce Jenner, he's just, you know, we've always had eccentrics, we've always had strange characters, okay, whatever. No, I mean, I just read a column in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago by their sports writer yeah. presenting Caitlin as an extraordinary profile in courage. Yeah. We are supposed to celebrate, we're supposed to revere, to honor these people yeah. instead of properly looking at them as damaged souls, as tortured human beings. We're doing something else. We are going along with what Rusty Reno calls the empire of desire, yeah. whereby whatever floats your boat. As long as, other, as long as you're not infringing upon what other people want to do, you can do anything you want. The, the Baltimore, the riots in Baltimore, we heard the response to that coming from our president and all the other progressives talking about poverty and access. It was 1971 all over again. They did not know how stale they sounded. Instead of the truth of that neighborhood, which is not poverty and access. It's about young men growing up without fathers. It's a family crisis. It's not an economic crisis. Yeah, I, I, interesting here to, just to think about uh, in connection with the book. Uh, you know, one is how do you regulate a realm that, that you know, thinks along these lines, uh, that thinks along antinomian lines, and that largely thinks desires or something uh, to be unleashed, uh, and how do you actually achieve order, and how do you reflect and think about it? Uh, I, I mean, I suppose you know w w one one response is what we see on college campuses uh, with regards to the sex crimes coming out of the Office of Civil Rights, which you know has uh, told schools uh, which actually try these cases, which has always seemed bizarre to me, uh, that you can convict on a preponderance of the evidence, not guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and it seems to me the but the deep background to that is is something like a, a sexual carnival on campus uh, that produces all sorts of problems and produces uh, all sorts of mismatches and um, uh, hurt feelings, et cetera, you know, traumas. Uh, and then and then this becomes sort of a way to reachieve order uh, in this regard to have this sort of very strict clamp down uh, and such that perhaps that produces, uh, you know, one level, you, you see these sorts of, you'll have a contract, a sexual contract. I've, I've been reading about these lately. Or maybe men and women leave each other alone because they're so scared to talk to one another. I don't know. Uh, but it seems to me that's, that's sort of the real world effect of what we're talking about. And one, one real world effect. This is the process of liberalism. Liberal culture or progressive culture starting in the 60s meant a breakdown of traditional norms. 
including the norms of young male-female courtship. We decided to let them live next to each other in dormitories, use the same bathrooms. We, uh, the sexual revolution in particular, destroyed, again, the behavioral protocols among men and women. It destroyed family identities. A father is this, a mother is this. You, one does one thing, the other one does the other thing. We discredited all of those structures of ordinary life. Well, then we're surprised when we see chaos follow. I mean, are, we, we didn't expect this to happen. Well, well, of course we expected it to happen. But what liberalism then did is try to use the state to bring order back into these sexualized worlds. That's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to make regulation, explicit regulation, play the role of cultural values, uh, traditional values that we had before. Said, Richard, this is not going to work. It, it, you, you can't make this into a rule written down in a handbook and then spoken by counselors and deans on college campuses. That's not going to work. We're going to see more and more problems. We're going to see more and more lawsuits coming out of this. But this is the liberal process. Break down the culture. The state can then come in and try to pick up the pieces. It's an unworkable formula. It's unsustainable. I was thinking about, uh, in the book, the way we reflect or the way we receive our news. Uh, you know, and this is uh, part two of the book. There is this presentation of, uh, and, and I found myself agreeing and disagreeing, of, in particular, thinking about young people here and, and some of the essays and the way they receive news, or rather choose not to receive news. Um, and, and kind of an appeal back, uh, one essay in particular, to the middle brow culture of the 1950s and the ways that, you know, the idea that Americans would be playing more from a common script, but that also it would be an attempt to bring uh, higher philosophical ideas into discussion and to keep those um, guiding the discussion. I suppose w at one level, I, I would agree uh, in terms of the way we receive news and, and think about it and what the way news is presented to us, in particular, just thinking about you know, politics. It's always about polls and who's moving up and who's moving down, never really about detailed policy coverage. Uh, but it also seems to me we're in a much better position in the sense of opening up, opening up realms of criticism uh, so that a lot of these sort of, the you know, thing about the empire of desire, assuming Reno is correct there, uh, there's a lot of ways it can be critiqued now that maybe it couldn't have been uh, when you just had the big three television networks and maybe a couple of newspapers in every state, and that was how people got their news. Now it's much more diffuse. It is more diffuse, and we do have streams now of of criticism that we didn't have before, and the 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 lock of uh, moderate liberalism on on mainstream media ha has been broken. We've taken universality away from Walter Cronkite. That, that, that is an accomplishment. My concern is that it hasn't stopped the progressivist juggernaut. It keeps moving in spite of, for instance, the last midterm elections. The last midterm elections were a rebuke to the Obama administration and the Democratic Party. It was one of the biggest wipeouts in American history in midterm elections. Uh, all these governor's races turned, and they turned a lot more than people expected. The pollsters were way off on this. This did not slow the progressivist impulse one single bit. We still end up with the abomination of the White House being turned into an illuminated poster for a progressivist cause. To, to paint the White House in rainbow colors after that judicial decision 
is such a civic violation that it's, it's hard to talk about. The White House should never be turned into a vehicle of partisan expression. The White House belongs to everyone. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and yeah. especially when you got a very divisive decision. 40% of the country was very upset by that decision. And painting the White House was not a celebration, a kind of feel-good act. It was even more so grabbing all those 40% of people by the neck and ramming their faces in the dirt. That's what the president did that night. And the fact that we didn't get more judgment of that action. Instead, I mean, the mass media, by and large, said, wasn't that really cool? That was so cool. I say, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Have you people lost your civic bearings completely? Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I think the, the position largely is uh, they're on the right side of history. Uh, those who right. disagree with them right. are not. And, uh, and there, there are no real arguments at this point uh, for, for preserving it, for preserving opposite sex marriage. Um, yeah, no, I was, I, I, I was struck by that as well. Uh, but yeah, no, it seems to me it's largely in Obama's mind, uh, same sex marriage, some, something like that is in the same realm as uh, Martin Luther King's uh, movement. Uh, it's, it's something that right. uh, we really can't now dissent from. Um, but it, you know, and, and I guess in the way X we're, we're talking about the way the media covers things, but I, I suppose largely we shouldn't be so surprised if, if this process of education we're talking about, and particularly in elite schools, the way it's done, those who come out of those schools go into journalism. Uh, they're right. they're going to largely, you know, dig in and learn. Yeah, they're going to depend yeah. on that. So we shouldn't be surprised. I suppose, though, it is the case. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, a, a lot of the blogging is pretty good. Uh, I mean, you, you do some good blogging. Uh, uh, there is there is something there that wasn't there before that uh, would seem to that would seem to talk, you know allow us to discuss this that that we yeah, haven't before. Yeah. Some of the essays well, I, would, I, would I say that were a little too dismissive uh, of that of that phenomenon. Uh, that's may, yeah. I, I, I you you could be right. What I see is the progressive formula is this: if we get fifty one percent, we're going all the way. All we need is 51%, and we will run headlong. We'll take that as a mandate to do anything we can to push the causes. That 49% that voted against us, the hell with them. That's, that, is, I think, is the, is, is, is the position. So if those, if the media, if the bloggers can't get over that 49%, threshold i i i see them as a failure yeah i i interesting as well i mean it it, it seems in terms of the progressive um uh say juggernaut not stopping i mean at one level there is uh i mean there, there's a narrative on the right progressivism is a foreign intrusion into american life <clears throat> i wonder if that's necessarily the case uh, and, and, and I'm speaking, thinking specifically here about big government and big government policies and as they affect the economy. But it seems yeah. also, and this, this actually makes me think, Obama knows what he's doing and knows he can get away with it because what has become more true, uh, particularly uh, over the last 50 years, is that the fund of Lockean individualism has continued to move forward and now has moved far beyond just limiting government rule of law property rights but actually now contributes to the way we think about our individuality uh, and also becomes the idea that the, what it means to be an American is the progressive growth of my individualism. And now that means marriage has no real definition. Uh, religion is an individualistic pursuit. It's not, not some sort of concrete thing that we want to protect. Uh, Let's not even talk on, about religion. Go on, Let's talk about worship. Yeah, but yeah, that's right. You can go on and on in this vein. And I think it, at this point, uh, uh, Obama and his supporters and those on the court understand very well where American history, uh, where the thought process seems to be moving. We've kind of forgotten the Puritan fund uh, that Daniel Dreisbach talks about in your book. That seems to have been 
marginalized sufficiently now and is no longer contributing to the conversation uh, in, the, in the American mind uh, the way it once did. Right. I, I, I think that's the case. So uh, in thinking here uh, about the overall discussion uh, of, of the American mind, where are the green shoots that maybe we can think about uh, of, of th- things that, that could be built on uh, that you see maybe you know, sweeping against or you know, presenting the possibility to move against a lot of the national consequences that are identified in the book, welfare dependency, political ignorance, uh, and also this sort of thinking with feelings and identities rather than with reason. You know, I think we have always cause for optimism in the United States. We're, we're a long-running country, and there has been no greater force for good in the world than the United States for the last 200 years. That's my, that's my faith, and I think it's warranted by, by the history of the United States. So we, we've been through bad times, uh, and we've had great leaders step forward, and we've had populist movements come, come forth that reinvigorated the civic sphere. It may take some disaster, a depression, or a war to break people out of their social, personal uh, absorptions and become responsible citizens and discerning consumers once more and to restore traditional values. Uh, But I think it will happen. We're going to have a third great awakening. This This is my my faith. And uh, I I don't see this dispensation continuing. Uh, Ignorance can't can't survive. Uh, The the denial of natural law can't survive for very long. So my option is to look for those signs of greatness returning. Look for the reassertions of American exceptionalism taking place and see if we get the great figures stepping forward to to lead them into reality. Mark Bauerlein, thank you for your time. The book is The State of the American Mind. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Richard. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.